What's up guys and gals, welcome back to the Nerd Castle. Today in the world of indie games, we're going to be fooling around with a title called Lone Star. This may be one of the more original roguelikes that I've seen come out in the last year or so. This one's very, very interesting. It's played around with some ideas, I guarantee you there's going to be some people that see this game and instantly just stroke out and are just like, eh, this looks boring to me. But if you actually get down to a bare bones fundamental game design level, this is a really intelligently designed game for people that really like creating overpowered builds and like focusing on minutia and really sort of understand step function, sort of, I guess, formulas and how they interact with one another. You'll see what I mean in a second. Lone Star is a game where you are a space bounty hunter going out to kill a number of bad guys that all have different ways of attacking you, and you need to build a ship out of nine modules that all interact with each other in a three by three grid in order to come up with enough DPS and attack power to wipe them off the map. That's the whole point of the game. I'm entirely too stupid for this title. So keep in mind while I can present this title to you for the day, I'm not going to be playing it very well because this is not the kind of game that I play, nor the kind of game my work brain just doesn't work how this game wants it to work, all right? I have ADHD brain. I don't have like a highly focused brain that can really, really look down the barrel of focused processing powers. So this is not a game for me, but it may be a game for you. And in fact, it is a really, really good game despite the fact it's not for me. Uh, let's go ahead and start a game. So at the beginning of the game, we gotta choose a ship. We can get the shielder. Uh, the shielder has three modules up front, and then it's got a module in the back that allows us to upgrade the energy that we're gonna be loading into these guns up here. We also have the space walker. Uh, this guy's a little bit different. Kind of functions a little bit the same though. Basically, as it works in this game, you have dice. Those dice are different colors, white, blue, and orange. And different dice can only go inside different loaders. And then there's going to be different support things that, like, multiply or take a look at averages and then add them all together. Like, there's a bunch of different ways that this game works. Uh, the second half of it, we'll go with the shielders since that's the normal experience. And I guess in the five or six hours I've played the game in the last day or so, uh, this is probably the one that I've put the most into. The beginning of the game, you also get a pilot randomly. All of these pilots will markedly change the way that you play the game going forward. You're going to want to build around their inherent talent a lot of the time. They also get a randomized talent as a secondary go just to add even more replayability. And then when you level up your account by playing, uh, they will get another random talent that makes them even stronger. This game has a huge amount of content. There are people reporting on the forums that they've played for like 20, 30, 40 hours and they're still unlocking things. That is actually insane to me for an early access game. And so it seems like this is one of those titles that's definitely going to go the distance. You can reroll the pilots if you don't like the ones that you got. I don't super like the talents that I got here, and I have a lot of rerolls. So let me go through until I find one that fits my play style. I don't hate her. She allows me to steal items from shops, and we get two more shield points. So I'll go with Wolfie. That sounds good for right now. And then we embark on our mission. This game is very, very simple. They will give you a string of criminals that you've got to go catch inside your spacecraft. That's it, and you defeat them by using your wits and a powerful build. The first guy that's wanted is Bernard. He's got an antique ship left by his grandfather, but regular maintenance keeps it in good shape. It looks like every time he loads an energy, he gets durability to three. So that's actually going to be a little bit tough to overcome. But he's the first. Oh, we can beat him on all three lanes. All right, so here's how this works. This is going to take a little bit of explanation. And I'm going to have to open up some tabs, too. There we go. You have three lanes. Your guns occupy a space in that lane. They fire directly forward. You can move your ship up or down. That will negate a lane on either side and shift your lanes over and to the left, but it costs you fuel in order to do that, which is a very limited resource. So you only want to do that when you absolutely have to to save yourself. Or if a boss fight like requires you to move around, which there are kind of mobility checks in this game. Every single module on your ship has slots. They come in three colors, white, orange, and blue. White, blue, and orange. That's the order of how good they are, effectively. Yellow is generally considered to be better than blue. Blue is considered to be better than white, so on and so forth, for kind of like, I guess, rarity checks. You have a dice pool down here. Every single turn, you will roll dice, and you will get random dice faces with random dice colors based on the stuff you have down there. So we have one, two, three, four, five, and we have like three whites, it looks like, 
an orange and two blues. So we just drew our two blues. You kind of get how that works. You have shields. Damage always goes to shields first for you before it goes to HP. So that gives you a little bit of wiggle room tactically. Sometimes it makes sense to soak a hit rather than to mitigate it. And then, of course, the enemy has a shield that functions differently. If you reduce their shield down to zero, they lose their next turn and you just get to unload on them. And that's the way that the game functions. So let's go ahead and get started. Now, already at the beginning, we've got ourselves a problem here. I can't mitigate this seven at the bottom because I only have one slot and the maximum dice that I can pull is a five. So I can't mitigate this down here. Can't be done. I can eat a hit to my shield. I have this unit right here. What it does is if I put a blue or an orange inside of it, it will upgrade the damage that that blue or orange does by one. As of right now, though, we don't really have the greatest dice, and so I think dodging is probably going to be our best play on this one. The downside to that is this guy, you really got to defeat his durability all in one go if you want to stun him. So stunning may not become the kind of thing that we can get done on this run. Now, this central unit right here, I just upgraded my blue from a 2 to a 3 using my gentle tap device. This pair core, if I load two energies into it, that have the same value, it will add plus two damage. So if I put those two threes in there, look at that, it becomes an eight instead of a six. And now we're blasting through that guy's shot and we're dealing six damage, as you can tell from the arrow. We also need to mitigate down here. I'm gonna do that right there. Now, an interesting part of this game is that the dice in your hand do not disappear at the end of your turn. You get to hold on to them, up to 10 of them in your hand at a time, if you have enough dice to actually have 10 dice in your hand. That's a really, really important thing about this game, because it's super easy to use up all your dice every single turn, and end up only getting 3 dice per turn, and not having enough to mitigate the huge amounts of damage the enemy's throwing at you. So a big part of this game is kind of just thinking about, is it worth it right now to go full burn on this guy? Should I hold back a little bit and just deal a little bit of damage? What has the rhythm and the tempo of his combat looked like so far? So there's almost like a little bit of an intuitive nature to it as well, which I find very interesting. Uh, we'll go down this way. I don't like using this much fuel in the first battle, but that seven just cannot be mitigated at this point in the game. Like it's just not a thing that I can really do anything about. So what we will do is we're gonna save that three but we're gonna upgrade it with the gentle tap device for next turn, and then we're gonna fire right there. We won the showdown, and he's got one HP left. I don't really wanna dodge him on this turn. Oh good, he ran out of juice finally, dude. I was wondering when he would. Uh, we'll just go ahead and load up. We'll mitigate every single one of his attacks because we've got an easy win right there. And bang, bang, bomb, we won. You see how the combat's kind of addictive in this game? It's basically, if you've ever seen Dragon Ball Z, and you've got like Frieza and Goku, you know, and they're dueling with their energy beams, like pushing each other forwards and back, or like Harry Potter, if you prefer Voldemort, and Harry Potter having, you know, a wizard's battle. It's got kind of that addictive visual flair to it, all wrapped up in kind of like a bluegrass, cowboy, bebop sort of twang. Uh, we get a unit right here to add to our ship. Your ship has a maximum weight down here. Different events and things and defeating bosses will allow you to upgrade that so that you could put more modules on your craft. We have an evolutionary core. If we load an energy, it gains a strength. After we load three energies into it, it will gain tri-power, which that's all that tri-power means is after you activate this unit three times with energy, it looks like it'll add an extra strength. We've also got this guy down here, the high voltage amplification core. This guy right here has two slots and it has overclock. So if we load energy into the unit, if we load in energy that is higher than the overclock threshold, it gains plus one damage. I'm kind of like meh on both of these. I don't really care about either of them. Either one of these is basically just a filler for me. But I think this one's better just due to the fact that it has three slots and it activates its power every time you load it. Or I guess the first time you load it without a threshold, like it's easier to activate to get that plus one damage. Uh, every single time you catch a criminal, the game sort of signifies that you got a bounty by letting you go on vacation. And so we get an option of what we want to do on our vacation. We can go get a free unit for our ship. We can go to an unknown event. We can grow, go to a shop. 
Uh, given our character's ability to steal, it's probably the best idea to go to the shop. And so we will go on into the star coin shop, and we can steal one item, but we can't buy from stores due to her ability. So we kind of want to pick the best thing here that makes us the happiest. So we have a really good legendary treasure right here that I think is a really solid pickup. I was kind of conflicted between two options here. Three options. Actually, I like four of these. That's one thing I really like about this game. A lot of the units are really useful, and you can see, like, conditionally how they're going to work. This guy reduces all damage suffered less than 5 to 1. That's really, really good and makes our shield go a long way because it's pretty rare until mid-late game that you're taking more than 5 damage on any lane. We have turn energy device. This guy spins up, and we can click it every turn. When we click it, we get an energy, a white energy dice that has a value equal to the current turn number. That means the longer we're in a fight, the better this gets, up to turn 9, where we can generate free 9 energies. This guy right here will convert any energy into a blue 3 point, and if you put a 4 or higher into it, it will give you 2 3 energy dice. This guy right here, if you load something greater than 4 into it, uh, you get double strength, which is really, really good. I'm sorry, in your hand is greater than four. You get double strength. And so all four of these, I think, play really strongly into an early game build. Metal coating, though, sort of guarantees our safety. So I'm a little bit inclined to go after that and steal that and then pick up the units later because that is a really, really, really good unit. And so we'll leave the shop right there. Our vacation is now officially over. Womp, womp, womp. Name a worse feeling than going back to work on Monday after, like, taking your two weeks off for, like, a cruise or, like, a big vacation. Dude, just the worst feeling on Earth. All right. So we are up against Ryan now, the eponymously named. He has a unit on here called Disposable Defense Device. That means if he loses on the lane that that's deployed on, it blows up but it reduces our damage down to one. So basically it's a single use version of what we have right there. Uh, we do have a higher weight limit right now. The game does have good quality of life in the respect that it'll let you know if you can slot in more stuff right now. It won't let you go into a battle with your dick in your hands. Uh, you always are able as well to reroll any fight back to the beginning, but be forewarned your opening dice do not reroll. So this is effectively if you feel like you made a big misplay somewhere in your play group and you feel like that lost you the fight, uh, you can go back and go again, but it's not going to change the dice on your first turn from what I tested. Whether or not the dice rolls are predetermined all the way through the fight, I'm not super sure and didn't have time to test. That would be one of those things to ask on the forums, but I would assume the former is how it works, not the latter, because it working the latter way sort of diminishes the usefulness of that in some cases. Uh, but anyways, let's continue. We drew a two, three, four, five. Okay. This should be a pretty easy mitigative fight. We shouldn't have too many problems here. We should be able to blow him up on the first turn, I think. He's going to do a powerful attack on the next turn. Unforge oh, he's got three of those shield cores. Brutal. Okay, so we kind of need to win on, on all three lanes, and we need to do it by very narrow margins if we can manage that. We don't really want to waste dice here winning. So I'll upgrade that. Because we only need to deal one damage to destroy his shield cores, so why waste our big dice on it, you know? I'd rather not. So we won on all three lanes. He's going to do a big attack now. Don't know how big it's going to be, but we'll see. We still have a four dice left. Yeah, that's a pretty chunky attack. I think it should be... Ooh, bad dice this round. I don't know what we're going to do with that. Okay. I think we're going to have to dodge. I don't think we have a choice, so there goes that fuel. As long You always get one fuel after every fight, so as long as you only dodge once, you should be okay. I can upgrade you to a two. I can put you two in there, but that'll give me a six. That won't give me a win. I can upgrade you. And be honest with you, I don't love our situation here. I probably didn't need to play that one either. We also need to track down a way to convert our bad dice into good dice. So I like, I'm particular in this game, I like the modules uh, that will allow you to turn ones into threes and stuff like that. I've found great success using those modules to basically infinitely generate threes and fours for myself and then just make up for it by having a lot of units with a lot of slots. It's It's been an okay strategy. It's kind of like the green swarm deck version of this game. Uh, he is now dead. There we go. Finish him off. 
There's also a module, or there's a treasure that I like to find that makes it so you always have default to attack on every lane no matter what. What a great ability. Uh, we'll get our one fuel back right there and we get a new unit. So this micro crystal core isn't bad. This guy is interesting. So this guy will give us orange nine points and orange one points every time we load three energy in separate instances into it. This is interesting because there are some modules that if they are adjacent to another module that you put energy in, they are called like trickle modules or something like that, and they will load one energy into the thing that's to the left of them or to the behind of them. Filling this guy up for free would actually be pretty good. It wouldn't be bad, and nine point energy is kind of a game changer. That's a lot of surge energy that you can get in a fight, so I'm willing to give it a go and give it a try, Worst case is that we kind of like unslot it and just don't use it for a little while. We did get a new unit at the free unit stop on our vacation. I was hoping we'd get another shop so that I could steal from another shop. I'm going to be honest with you. Let me see what kind of units I can get here. Well, I took another overclock core, a tri-power core, because it gets plus four to its damage every time we triple load it. And it keeps track of that in between turns. It doesn't need to all be in one turn. I think for now our best course of action is to get the free 6 energy on the first turn from that support unit right there. And then we probably want to swap this guy out on the top lane because at least we're getting something out of this guy. Versus this attack unit which we're getting nothing out of. It just loads in the exact value. It's upgrades. I'm not happy with where our build is at right now. I don't feel like I have anything defining. Uh, looks like he's got a self-destruct device on here, so we need to beat him in six turns. Should be doable. Most of these early fights are pretty easy. He does have a chunky bit of HP, though. I'm kind of surprised how much HP he's got. All right, he's going to do a powerful attack on next turn. Let's kind of, like, look and see what we can do here. I'll upgrade you. I will upgrade you. I think that, obviously, we sort of want to open on the first turn with just about everything that we've got just to get his durability down a little bit but I'm gonna preserve my four just to see what he does on his next turn like how bad is it gonna be is it dodgeable it wasn't as terrible as I thought it was gonna be I thought it would be worse I think we are gonna have to slip one lane But I do get some strength right there, and if I double load this guy, I get the plus two. So we definitely have damage still going out. Let's upgrade that to a two just while we're in the neighborhood. And there we go. We've got his shield broken, so he's now paralyzed, and hopefully we get a good draw here, a good roll. And we can, well, okay. Not great. Let me see what I can do here. That's ten damage. Actually, I think we skate in just barely by the skin of our teeth right there. Cool. Easy peasy. The true art is an explosion. I, I could agree with that. Explosions might be an art. Oh, that guy was an elite, so we get a treasure. Uh, when an enemy's durability goes down to zero, deal 10 damage to it. Yeah, that's pretty good. That would have basically made that last fight a lot easier. At the end of your vacation, if you have unspent days, gain coins. We can't spend coins outside of events, so we don't really want to focus on coins too much. We got another slot right there, and we get five days vacation with two shops available. Let's go. Uh, we want to go to probably the big spender shop. Placeholder gas is pretty good because we're running a lot of slots. I'm tempted to steal it. So it makes our default strength equal to the amount of slots in any given lane. So our default strength would be four in the top lane, four in the mid lane, and three in the bottom lane. Which honestly buys you more breathing room than you would think in a lot of fights. So I'll take that guy. I think that was a really good steal right there. If we get another shop, we did not get another shop, but we did get a treasure. So we can try. Uh, with 12 coins, we can get one of three treasures. Let's have a look. So we've got three more HP. We've got two more energy on odd number turns and two fewer energy on even number turns. Ugh, that's a bit, That's you gotta be a little bit risky on that one. I think that could work, but when reducing the enemy's durability by three or more in a single turn, gain an energy. I don't really care about any of the three of these. This requires me to have foresight, which my entire life has been something I lack, so I guess I'll take the rock record. 
it's not that useful, but I'll take it. Alright, so we are up against the octopus as our first boss fight. Sometimes these are tough, sometimes these are easy. There's one guy with swords on him that's actually, I think, the hardest fight. I'll probably put... You right there, just to give us default 5 on the bottom lane. I'm probably not going to use you too much because I don't have a way to generate, you know, dice. But... Oh, support units done. Oh, it's only for attack units. Well, that was dumb of me. I should have put the other basic core down here. Then I would have a four right there. Womp womp. Uh, this guy's going to do a powerful attack on the next turn. It kind of feels like he's doing a powerful attack right now. Let me see what I can mitigate here. We obviously want to boost our top lane as much as possible. That gives us an eight. The good thing about placeholder gas is even if you don't use slots in a certain lane, they still count. So just slotting in an energy doesn't reduce it. So this actually makes the game a little bit more robust and interesting where I now have three damage right there. And then over here, I'm going to have to do something on this side, but I don't want to use my six yet. I want to save it. I can take one to the shields. That's no biggie. Oh, his beams look cool. How do I make my beams look all dark side of the force like his? That was dope, dude. Okay, an eight, a five, and a nine. What can I do here? Well, we've got easy upgrades right there for big pickups. This side, that takes us to a two. That would take us to a nine right there, though, and save us. That would give us one damage, and really, I'm kind of just fishing to sort of knock this guy's shield out. I mean, I guess I could go for the big hit right there. That gave us a lot of damage out of a one energy die, which I feel like we weren't likely to get anyways. And then we could play a little bit of catch up here, I think. Well, maybe not. We got a pretty bad dice roll right there. That's a tough one. I think I can almost mitigate right there. Almost. We still have shields up, so that's fine. 10 damage from our piercing spear right there. Now, here's what I really like about placeholder gas. When you stun somebody, I can just hold onto my hand and not care while he's in hibernation. And now I've got way more dice to play with over the course of the next couple conflicts. I probably should have upgraded a couple dice right there. That was a pretty obvious misplay, but my point still stands. We now have the ability to sort of like throw down on different lanes and we can reduce his durability again, should we desire to do so. So that takes us up to a seven. I mean, in for a penny, in for a pound, I say, just go for it. Give me a big hit on that top lane. That reduced his durability by a lot, so this boss isn't quite as bad. There's another boss that has two katanas on the back of him, and he alternates between a big center lane hit and, like, that same 27 damage hit spread between all three lanes. In my opinion, he's by far the hardest first boss because he requires kind of a focused build very early that deals a lot of damage or at least can dodge a lot very, very early if you pull him. He can be kind of a headache. Let's go for a plus one right there. We've got a seven die right there, and the man's is dead. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. We're off and over the top of the first boss. HP and fuel back, we get a rare treasure. So when an attack unit is loaded with nine points of energy, it gains one power. I don't really have a way to gain nine point energies, but that would play into this main ingredients and leftover pieces pod that we have over here we just need to find a way to auto load this thing so i need like a center piece that every time i load this guy or this guy puts one energy into him and then this thing right here will be an absolute machine and then this right here would come through and convert all of our nines into tens so like you know the attack unit in the spaceship center gains an extra two strength when you put energy in it. I'll probably take that, and then we'll move him to the center tile. By the way, quality of life, if you mouse over these things, it'll tell you exactly what on the grid is affected by each of these tiles. 
in case you were wondering. So we can get a unit right here. Honestly, for the placeholder gas strategy, I sort of feel like we want as many attack slots as possible. Single-use arc. When we load an energy, it destroys itself and doubles the power of the attack unit behind it. Okay. So I throw a, an orange one in there, assuming that that comes up after I double load this guy with, let's say, two fours, which would put him at 10, and then it would dip up it to a 20 on that one turn. I can see the usefulness of it. I don't know if it justifies the use of a slot, though. What's this guy do? When you load an energy, restores six shield points. That's better, I think, because shields are basically infinitely reusable HP. So I feel like being able to restore shields is something that in my time with the game, which is like four hours or so at this point, I feel like I haven't seen a lot of ways to restore shields yet, so I'd probably take that. Six days of vacation after killing the boss. I would say let's take the unknown over here. Who knows? Uh, so, a pair of Treant brothers contact you. They're traveling around in search of a comfortable start with radiation wavelengths. They express their desire to trade their precious attack unit for travel funds or fuel. Oh, boy, those are good. That's what I was looking for. Okay. That's what I needed. Actually, it may not be what I needed. Chain works differently than I thought it would. I thought it was going to arc energy in between things. But apparently it transfers energy in between the chain units, which I think is still pretty good. Like, I don't think that's bad. So with two chain units right there, this doesn't really get any bonus, but it would load up that one next to it in equal quantity, which I think is going to be sort of invaluable. No shops or anything for right now, so I'll focus on taking treasures. We can take two damage. Oh, this is that thing from Slay the Spire where you stick your hand into the ooze covered in metal. We're basically gambling. Uh, if I got this at a different time, I would do it, but we got it, like, right when we're about to go up a tier and start fighting harder mobs, and so, like, I would prefer to not go into the next map, map with low HP. That would just be my preference. Uh, we're up against the Immobilizer. I'm going to guess he does. If I move him, this guy gains strength. Okay, so we're not going to be able to dodge very much in this fight. We're going to want to avoid that. But as you can see, it's a very creative original game. I honestly think this is probably one of the better roguelikes of the last year in terms of creativity. I don't think I have the brain for it. I think I'm too dumb for this game. Like, I've caught myself over the last four or five hours making mistakes uh, and losing and having to reroll fights a lot just because, you know, it's not the kind of game that I'm very good at. But... I do still think it's a good game, despite the fact that I'm not very good at it. I don't suppose there's a whole lot I can do about this particular, but I reduced it down to one damage. We've got really, really, really good relics right now, which is like what's carrying this run. I don't feel a lot of confidence in any of my units, but I do feel like we've got really good relics right now. And so we'll load those in right there. Dude, that's actually a pretty good unit right there. That's a that's a pretty wild unit. It give you get a lot of bang for your buck out of that thing. Like being able to double attack power on different lanes is pretty catastrophically pretty catastrophically strong for covering multiple points of attack at the same time. I've never seen chain units before. I think those got added into the game after I leveled up to level 6 or something, and I haven't done a run at level 6 yet. But yeah, this is a huge game with a ton of content, a lot of things going on. Uh, the game itself, as of right now, is on sale for 10 bucks. $10. A $10 roguelike that people are saying after, like, 30 hours, they're still getting unlocks in. It's a really good game. I can see how it would not be the game for some people, just because it's a very mathematically inclined sort of step function, how good do you do with iterative arithmetic type of game. But it is a brain tickler, and I do feel stimulated when I'm playing it. But anyways, my name is Splattercat. I sift through the pile to find what's worthwhile in the world of indie games every single day so you don't have to. Today I'm on the chopping block. I am fiddling around with a game called Lone Star. Tomorrow we'll play something else. Thanks for hanging out, and that's all I got for you. Bye, folks.